Welcome back to the Open Mic Reunion Show, and I'm joined by my guest, Shantia Smith. Let's give her a hand clap of praise. <laughs> and Linda King, Linda King Tribble. Uh, Miss Tribble, um, in your episode, you discuss uh, some of your childhood growing up with your mom, not having a real good relationships, but you also tapped into uh, drug addiction. Um, so can you tell the audience how you got into the drug world and got to using drugs? So I got into using drugs because I was dating this young man who was actually Michael's father. Um, I was dating him and I was seeking attention and I couldn't find the attention that I wanted and it wasn't the attention that I needed because I was searching in all the wrong places. So he was, became my husband but before then he was dating this girl that he really cared for. Well he used to date her and she got on, she was on drugs so he was doing everything in his power to help her. She she OD'd, she passed away. So my thought was that if I would try some drugs, then maybe he would reach out to help me. But he never helped me, so I became addicted to drugs. I never got the help that I needed from him. And it actually, he really couldn't give me what I needed anyway. So that's how I got into the drug world. So what was your relationship like before you started using drugs? And what was it like after you started using drugs? My relationship with him before I started using drugs, it was chaos because he was a drug dealer. So it was like, to me it was actually more fun than chaos because I was living this lifestyle that I thought was nice. It was all the glamour and all the glitter. Um, he would give me things and drive around in nice cars, so I thought that that's what I wanted. Um, so it was fun, but it was chaos because I had to look behind my back a lot because I didn't know who was coming after him. If they caught him, they was going to catch me. Um, after the drugs, it was bad because I lost myself. And in turn, he wound up getting shot. Um, and it really got worse because I didn't realize how bad off I was because when he got shot and I remember sitting there talking to the doctors I was blaming myself and you know it's just really it was bad um, afterwards but it was a relief to be away from him that way I didn't have to do the pain of getting beat on a daily basis and um, doing the drugs anymore so so you suffered through domestic violence in that relationship as well yes okay okay so in relationships following that did you ever find yourself craving attention from men that you weren't getting and then doing anything you could to get that attention or did you learn from that relationship i don't know i wasn't craving the attention anymore <laughs> i learned from that so almost 30 plus years later uh you are you are the woman you are <laughs> almost 30 plus years later you are the woman you are today because of those experiences and what you learned from them so if you had to tell a young woman going through something similar, um, dealing with a guy, craving his attention, willing to do anything to get it, what would your advice be to her? To know that you are enough, mm -hmm. that you are more than enough, and that the love that you desire and the love that you crave is really in God. And till we learn how to love ourselves as a woman or as a man, any, any, until we learn how to love ourselves, we will never even feel the love from another person anyway. So that we are enough. Women, we are enough. You don't have to seek behind a man. You don't have to run behind a man. And if he's showing you any, any sign of not wanting to be with you, take that sign and let it go. Now, Shanti, unfortunately, you too suffer through some domestic violence in your relationships. Um, due to the lack of your father being there, what role did your father play um, in you being in, un in unhealthy relationships and staying in those unhealthy relationships? Well, the being part came from him not being. 
um, I didn't have that role model from him. So in my mind, I thought, well, if a man, if my, the man that birthed me doesn't love me enough to stay around, then why would I think that any man will love me enough to stay around? So that played a part in me not staying in the relationship. I would push the guy away if I thought I was doing something wrong. It always came back to me because it stemmed from me thinking as a child that he didn't love me. So why would I think that a man would love me? Me staying in the relationship was me craving that attention that he didn't give me. So I craved it from the next man. You gotta think about it, me growing up and not having him around, so the first man that tells me he loved me, I'm gonna believe him. And whatever the love is that he shows me, which can be him being abusive, it can be him physically, emotionally, mentally abused. If he say, I'm doing this because I love you, so I'm gonna stay because that's what I think the love is that my father supposedly gave me. So. I would say that that played a major part in why I stayed and why I left. Now, how old were you when you started going through the domestic violence? Um, I was 18. Yeah. I went through that for six years. Did you have children by this, this man? Yep. Okay, okay. Um, so you were also promiscuous a tad bit. Yep. Um, sleeping around. Um, wait, 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 hold up. Sleeping around. <laughs> You said it. Uh. <laughs> Promiscuous doesn't mean sleeping around. Meaning, I craved a lot of boys' attention. I'll say that. So I craved attention from, from men. I craved attention from little boys as being a little girl. I was the little boy, like the tall boy, but I dressed up as, I was a girl. I was girly, but I wanted to be around all the boys. I wanted to hang with all the boys. And I can say that if I had my father around, it would be Oh no, you don't be with them little boys. You go find you a little girl to be with. Or you go hang with your home girls and not the little boys. So I crave that attention from little boys from, I would say, probably about eight. Okay. So for someone who would say that some women use their daddy issues as a crutch uh, to remain broken or to live in their trauma or to bask in their hurt, what would, what, what's your response to that? Um, I would tell them to get help. And that's the only, that's the best advice I can give. Because I used to use that as an excuse. Well, I didn't have my father growing up, so I wasn't shown how to do this, and I wasn't shown how to do that. Me going through therapy helped me love myself. And me loving myself is what made me realize that I don't need a man to do anything. Not saying that I can't be in a healthy relationship or have a healthy man in my life, I have to love me first, just like your mom said. If I don't know self-love, then I can't give love to anybody. Okay, okay. Let's give Shani a uh, hand clap of praise to <laughs> And now we'll take questions from the audience. What was your aha or awakening moment in uh, those, um, either one can uh, answer. My awakening moment in doing the video? No, in life. So there's a point of transition where okay. you've gone through this gotcha. and then you had that moment so, that you woke up. So my awakening moment was my son. Um, a little backstory: I was in an abusive relationship with my son dad for like six years. And the entire pregnancy, I didn't have abuse from him, but up until the day before my baby shower. And we had this really big fight. And the day after my baby shower, I went to labor with my son. Mm. So that was it for me. If you can do whatever you're doing to me, knowing that I'm carrying your child, yeah, that's it. My son is what woke me up. And I say all the time, my son saved my life because I don't know what I would have did if I wasn't ever pregnant. It could have ended with him killing me or me killing him and then going to jail and losing my life. So I would say my son was my awakening moment. So my awakening moment was when he was in the hospital. He had got shot in his head and he was in the hospital um, bed. And he wanted some ice water. But he couldn't drink ice water. He had to have ice chips. So um, he said, Penny, give me some ice water. And I said, you can't have ice water. You got to suck on the chips. 
and he sat in the hospital bed, shot in his head. B, if you don't give me some MF water, I'm going to whip your MFA. And I looked at him, <laughs> laying in that hospital bed, still threatening me. Knowing that if I took him back home, he would do it again. That was my wake up moment. So I took him to his mother's house and I never looked back. Hi, so I'm um, Shantia, right? Yeah. You kind of touched on the fact that your son was your awakening moment. Mm -hmm. um, considering actually that both of you um, were parents or are parents, mm -hmm. how did you shield your children from the trauma that you were experiencing, um, especially as you were healing? Oh, wow. I literally was just talking to them in the corner about that. Um, my son will be 11, and he asks questions now. And the questions are more so along the lines of, why are you and mommy not together? Or why daddy has a wife now? And I honestly just keep saying to myself, I'm not going to have that conversation with him. I'm going to let his dad tell him, we're not together because this is what I did to your mom. And I also want to sit one day and have the conversation and say, listen, I don't want your dad's image to be tainted because of what we went, to, went through, because he's an awesome dad to his son. But I also want you to know the true story of what your mom has been through and what you are not to do to women and what you are to be as a man. So I kind of like struggle with that now. I don't know if it's the right time to have that conversation with him, but I'm definitely going to have it. Yes, for either lady, how did your children inspire you throughout the experiences? Like, what part did they play in helping you get through it? Um, so I have a son and I have a, a daughter also. My daughter, dad, is awesome. And I say to, her, to myself all the time that I'm happy that she has a man that can be in her life and not her not experience what I experienced. When it comes to my son, it's more so of me just trying to teach him how to treat women and how not to be with women. So my kids inspire me every day to get up and be like, listen, you went through this for this amount of years, you still go through things, but you're here. And I'm gonna be an awesome mom to you and I'm gonna try every day to keep you away from certain things. I can't keep you away from everything. You can go through things, but I'm gonna help you get through. So that's how my kids are inspiration to me. So the question was, how did they inspire you to, me to get through what I was going through? Throughout the experience. Oh, what happened? Yeah. So they didn't, because I was too deep in. Mm -hmm. My daughter stayed with my mother. Mikey was with me. But I was too deep in to look at them to get through for them. Mm -hmm. But when I finally got through, I won't let nothing take me from them. So um, for both ladies, you both have daughters, um, and you talked about kind of what inspired you to, to move through it, and um, Shanti, I think is, is your name. You talked a little bit about the conversation that you have with your son, but as far as your daughter and how you say, you know, you had to learn to love yourself, what aspirations or what do you instill in your daughter to let her know that she has to love herself before any man can like what do you have something that yeah. you talk to her about so i have something that i do with her my daughter is very affectionate like sometimes it irks my soul because she'll do it about 10 times like why she in your face but i make sure i tell her i love you you're beautiful no you're a queen 
I don't say princess. I let her know from the jump that she's a queen, regardless that she's three or not. And I keep repeating that to her to let her know that you are to love yourself. And I make sure I let her know every day. So it became a habit. So now when I come in from work, it's like, mommy, I love you. You are a queen. Like you're a queen too. And this is what we go through all day every day and she'll say it repeatedly until i be like okay fair that's enough we don't gotta keep saying it but she say it and she know it just like for instance we were in the store and somebody was like you're so beautiful she said i know my mommy and daddy told me so it's i'll tell her things about herself so she can know that nobody can strip that from you because daddy and mommy installed that in you so that's what i do for her So um, my question is, is that, so you go through these experiences, right, and they affect you and they plague you in some kind of way. So you mentioned, Shantia, that, you know, he had, he has your, the man that was physically abusive to you now has a wife. Did you ever have a point and a moment when you were like, well, what was wrong with me that I, he could never become my husband or what is it that I did or did not do or was he not incapable, was he incapable of loving me because of there's something that I missed because my dad wasn't around? that made him, you know, do the things that he did to me? Um, I had those moments the entire time I was with him, all the way up until probably about my son was two, because that's when I started therapy. So I had those moments, it was always about something had to be wrong with me. It was, oh, well, he only, it was more so of excuses. Well, he only did it because I wore this, or I looked this way, or this man looked at me. So I always second-guessed myself the entire time I was with him. And up to when he, like, we left and we split from each other. It was, oh, he got a wife now. Oh, he, I've been with him for six years, and he ain't married me. And then I look at it like, oh, thank God, Jesus, Lord. That was, like, the best gift I ever had in the world, that I didn't marry him. I don't know what goes on in his relationship now. I, I don't care. As long as he does what he has to do for my son. It's just more so of, I feel like I dodged the bullet. And it was awesome to me. So now I'll never second guess myself. Um, it'll always be, what did I do to allow myself to accept these things? And how do I move past that? And then leave some ways that it'll always be that way. Part. So, your name is Miss Penny, or what is it? I'm sorry. Penny, Linda. Linda. Okay, I'm sorry. I had to need to disrespect you. So, you said that you were seeking attention, right? Do you feel like in your childhood that you didn't get attention when you were younger? Did you have other siblings? Do you feel like in some sort of way men didn't look at you, or was there something about his father or whoever the man was that you wanted that type of attention? Because I didn't get it from a childhood. Um, so when growing up in my home, I was the middle child and I always fought for love from my mother, from my father, from my sister, and from my brother. And no, I didn't get what I needed from that household. And I fought to get it from outside. But in that fight of not getting it outside but then finding God, I fought even harder to make sure that my children know I love them, I show them that I love them, but to also make sure that my children love each other and we have a tight connection, sisters, brothers, siblings, grandchildren, that we are all a tight. Okay, my question is to Linda. Since you're in, um, I know you're a married woman now, so do you have any situations at home that is ever a trigger in your new relationship to make you think back in the past and past relationships? Yes. Sometimes. And, you know, I had to, I struggled in my marriage for a while, and I had to look at myself because I got a good man, I got a good husband. I, I, I have a good husband, I really do. And I had to own the fact that a lot of things I had to let go of and say, oh, cause it really don't matter. Like, you know, and even with my husband's family, side of the family, you know, I would look at it and like, you know, they really don't like me or, or 
the issues. The, the issues that always try to creep back up inside your mind because they do what, however they do what they want to do, but I can't base it on them not liking me. And then what a therapist told me, whether a person likes you, loves you, dislikes you, hates you, whatever, that's still their issue. Whether they love me, there's something about them that wants them to love me. If they dislike me, there's something about them that wants them to dislike, dislike me. So in my marriage, yeah, I've, I've had them problems that tried to creep back up in, and then I learned how to not allow it to destroy my marriage. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a question for Ms. Linda. Um, first off, I wanted to say congratulations on your recovery um, because we all have suffered from having addicts in our families and um, me, myself, both of my parents lost their life to addiction. So Mike and your sister, you guys are so blessed to have your mom still here. Um, with that being said, I wanted to ask you what were some of the, first of all, how long were you struggling in your battle with addiction? And also, do you ever think about doing any outreach work or if, if so, um, what, what types of places do you go to to do outreach work? So, it wasn't that long that I was in it, maybe two years, I guess, if that long. Um, long enough. Yeah. Um, I've done outreach um, through my church. I've done outreach there, and I used to go to the AA meetings and NA meetings and all that, um, but that's not for me. I find it more rewarding when I minister to a pre people one on one, whether it's for drug addiction, whether it, anything, because I'm a minister at my church now. So, ministry is a lifestyle for me. So I don't want to pinpoint it necessarily to like a drug addiction, far as drugs, because like you said, we can be addicted to anything, anything. anything. So, I minister to people a lot. So I, I do give back, and and I really. Really, I, serving the Lord is 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 what I love to do. You're welcome. Let's give these ladies a hand clap. I think what we all can gather from these two testimonies, my God, um, <laughs> why my mind's in church, um, is that um, overcoming whatever we're going through starts with loving ourselves first. Um, not being angry at ourselves for going through what we're going through, but finding the courage and the bravery to pull ourselves up from our bootstraps with the help of God, because we can't do it by ourselves, um, to recover from whatever we're going through. Let's give them a hand clap one more time. And when we come back, we'll hear from Tanisha about her unpopular truth about the Christian faith, and from Elena about the depression she went through when she lost her childhood friend.